Welcome to Lecture 1 of Genetics. I am Andrea Knutson, and I will be your instructor for the term. In this first module, we're going to be studying chapters 1 and 2 of our textbook, which represents more of an introduction to the field of genetics, as well as provides some background information on cell biology. I think by the time we get to the end of chapter 2, you'll start seeing a very early glimpse of genetics, but this is just some uh, background information to help you understand what is to come. The material is going to be found in two videos. I will record a video with chapter one and then a second video for chapter two. In chapter one, I'm going to discuss and kind of present to you this brief overview of the history of genetics, introduce you to some of the major scientists of their time, and then we'll talk about model organisms. I'll give you an idea of how model organisms have shaped our understanding of genetics today, and we'll review some then surface level definitions here um, of topics in genetics that are gonna help make the next few modules easier to understand. We'll look at the various ways by which we study genetics, kind of the levels by which we study them, uh, such as from a population perspective, an individual perspective. Uh, then we'll consider the three branches of genetics before uh, spending time on the ethics and bioethics of genetics. Uh, I'll go through chapter two as we get to the start of those, but ultimately um, the slides associated with chapter two, we're going to spend time reviewing the major concepts of cell biology, specifically looking at the eukaryotic cell and the organelles and various functions of um, the eukaryotic cell. So let's go ahead and get started. To understand the earliest study of genetics, we actually need to go back to Greece during the classical period. So the first um, philosopher that we will consider is Pythagoras, who lived between 570 and 490 BC. He surmised that all hereditary material came from the child's father, which is not um, a new concept at this time. The mother provided only the location and the nourishment needed for a growing fetus, with the man's semen um, kind of being that proverbial cocktail of hereditary information, coursing through his body, collecting the fluids from every organ um, in its travels in order to create um, everything that was needed for uh, the ultimate growing fetus. In contrast, Hippocrates, uh, known as the father of medicine, he lived between about 460 and 370 BC, and he recognized that the male contribution to a child's hereditary um, information is carried in the semen as minute little particles from every part of the body. And females had a similar fluid, which wasn't named, um, but the fusion of these two fluids, male semen and some unnamed female fluid, gave rise to new individuals exhibiting traits of both parents. So here we have this introduction that the female is more than just an incubator for um, the male contribution um, in terms of genetics. Lastly, uh, we look at Aristotle, who lived between about 384 BC to 322 BC. He proposed that active humors, and ultimately humors today are known as blood. Um, so blood served as the bearer of hereditary traits and further believed that male semen determined the baby's form, while the mother provided material from which the baby was made. So we've kind of gone back to that idea that the female um, wasn't giving traits along, but just providing an environment with which a fetus can grow. Um, Aristotle further implied that all children should be boys, but he concluded that there were female babies, uh, and those female babies were the result of interference from the mother's blood. So I find that um, entertaining. Uh, some other early historical ideas surrounding genetics. It wasn't until the 1600s. So we've gone from BC now, about 322 BC, up to the 1600s, that strides were made to really understand the biological basis of life. Early scientists provo um, or proposed an idea called epigenesis, which states that an organism develops from a fertilized egg by a succession of developmental events that transforms the egg into an adult. Uh, 
in addition, we have um, preformationism. That's the idea that a fertilized egg contained a complete miniature adult called a homunculus. And um, that fertilized egg just continued to grow and grow until um, we had a, something the size of um, an infant ready to be born. We also have the idea of spontaneous generation thrown around in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, even into the very early 1800s. This is the idea that the creation of a living organism um, comes from some kind of non-living organism. We create life from non-life. And that was a um, certainly an entirely different view, but something that was very widely accepted and widely accepted for a few hundred years. Um, in, gene or in microbiology class, we go into this in more detail detail, but we just briefly mention it here. Uh, you know, the, I want to say the irony of these ideas that were being studied, early people were actually domesticating animals. And you might ask, how does this tie to the history of genetics? Well, imagine animal domestication. We take a wild animal and making it part of an observed or a domesticated herd. And it goes beyond that um, because once we have a herd, we see traits we like from some of the animals. For instance, maybe in my flock of sheep, I see three sheep in my flock that I really like. Their wool is soft, or maybe they produce offspring that are bigger and grow faster than, the, than others. And if I'm a sheep herder, <laughs> then I might want to keep those particular offspring in my herd while removing some of the other sheep from my herd whose wool is coarse or whose offspring are small, who don't grow as quickly. And that's the idea of domestication, the genetic part. Farmers were doing this for centuries before the study of genetics really took off. There are various other examples of early scientists looking for the explanation of hereditary traits being passed from parent to offspring. Modern genetics really begins with the contribution of two scientists. And so we're going to talk about Charles Darwin and Gregor Mendel um, in the mid-1800s or maybe mid, I guess, 1860s to 80s, that they set the stage for this rapid development of genetics that unfolded into the 20th century and even into the 21st centuries. So who is Charles Darwin? Charles Darwin um, he originally wanted to be a physician, but was reportedly afraid of the sight of blood. He um, was a naturalist who dedicated five years of his life on a voyage um, as a naturalist on the boat called the HMS Beagle. So from between the years of 1831 to 1836. And while on his travels, he observed, I mean, they it, this boat traveled throughout the world and he collected specimens from all these places. But while in his travels, he observed geological, geographical, biological contexts, um, which convinced him that existing species arose by descent with modification. Um, so ancestral species, we have some environmental event, we have some kind of geological specialization. And those ancestral species really adapt to a given environment. Some survive better than others. Those that survive um, continue to proliferate. And so we have this idea of descent with modification. And this thinking led him to formulate what's called the idea of natural selection, which provided an explanation for the mechanism of evolutionary change. Now it was pretty scandalous at the time. The 1800s, the idea of evolution rather than um, some of the other concepts and ideas that were out there in terms of religion, he went on to publish a paper in 1859 entitled On the Origin of Species, which described the current modern day theory of evolution, which um, from a scientific perspective is certainly still accepted. Moving forward, we'll look at Gregor Mendel, and we spend quite a bit of time this term looking at some of the P experiments um, that Gregor Mendel put together. So uh, Darwin lacked the understanding of the genetic basis of variation and in in inheritance, but this Augustinian monk named Gregor Mendel helped pave the way for our modern day understanding of how traits may be inherited through generations. 
Specifically, he showed how traits were passed from generation to generation as he studied the pea plant. And in his seven years that he spent studying the pea plant, Mendel relied on plants in his monastery gardens. Uh, specifically, he conducted a series of experiments and cross-pollination and looked at more than 20,000 plants during um, his seven-year study. Uh, he relied on math, so quantitative observation, to study the patterns of inheritance of these pea plants. And his work showed that traits were passed from parent to offspring in a very predictable manner. He specifically looked at seven traits. Um, he examined seed shape or form, which seeds might appear round or they might appear somewhat wrinkled. He looked at seed cotyledon, which are the first leaves that come out of the ground when a seed sprouts, and he saw that those were yellow or green. He looked at and considered flower color, either white flowers or purple flowers. He looked at pod form. Um, so this is the entire pea pod, which we see um, right here. And he saw that they were either full, meaning you couldn't see the individual peas within the pod, or they were constricted, where you could see little bubbles that represented each individual pea. He looked at pod color. Again, we saw green or yellow. He looked at flower location on a stem, and he saw two locations, axial, which was near the stems of the plants, or terminal, at the tips, which you can see here. And then he considered plant size itself, either tall plants or dwarf plants. So following very careful quantitative analysis of data, Mendel concluded that traits in pea plants are controlled by a pair of factors, and today we call those factors genes, and that members of a gene pair separate from each other during gamete formation, so as we're producing egg or sperm, such that one of the pair of uh, these genes comes from the mother, the other one comes from the father, we'll consider his findings in the form of three laws, which we will look at in, um, I believe it's module number three. We look at the, the law of segregation, which is where offspring acquire one hereditary factor from each parent, and then we consider the law of independent assortment, which is the idea that different traits have an equal opportunity of occurring together. Uh, we'll consider those in a bit of detail. He also proposed the idea of dominance where offspring express a dominant trait and can only express a, re a recessive trait if offspring inherit both recessive factors. Mendel did his experiments um, before, uh, and this is this is what I find so fascinating. He, he did his experiments before the structure or the role of chromosomes were known. And it was actually more than 20 years later before advances in the microscope allowed other researchers to identify chromosomes under the microscope and that members of most species have a characteristic number of chromosome pairs. So moving in forward in time, in um, the early part of the 20th century, the very, very first couple of years of the 1900s, it became clear to scientists that heredity and development were dependent on genetic information residing in genes contained on chromosomes, which are stored in the nucleus and by which both mother and father contributed gametes. Um, that is to say, eggs and sperm. So uh, Mendel, his work, you know, he published his work it wasn't very well recognized in the 1800s, but then the beginning of the 1900s approached and several scientists discovered that he'd already proposed this stuff 20, 30 years earlier. And so they were just documenting and supporting what he discovered. And thankfully, I think um, for him, those scientists recognized his work and gave him the credit um, as the person who really discovered modern day genetics. Moving forward, another key discovery was the result of three bacteriologists, Oswald Avery, Colin McLeod, and Macklin McCarty in 1944 at the Rockefeller Institute in New York. They were looking at the difference between two strains of Streptococcus pneumoniae, 
um, a bacterium that's responsible for pneumonia. And through some experiments where they looked at these two different strains, one strain was harmless, caused no disease, another very virulent, or that is the ability to cause pneumonia, they found evidence that DNA, or at the time they were calling it a transforming principle, and not a protein, so DNA and not a protein, was the carrier of genetic information in bacteria. And until that point, there were questions. Is it protein? It seems like it could be protein. Um, that's the carrier of genetic information of bacteria because that's what they could see. But ultimately, um, they, could, they found out that they could transform the properties of the two types of bacterial cells, making one harmless into a virulent form of the bacterium with this transforming um, part or particle or principle. And that helped clarify the chemical nature of genes. Ultimately, this led to proof that DNA carries genetic information, disproving some of those theories that were um, kind of being settled or sorted out around that time that it was protein and not DNA that was genetic material. We also have, if we continue mo moving forward through time, we have um, James Watson and Francis Crick. And now we're in the 50s, the 1950s. They discovered that the structure of DNA, um, they described it as a long ladder-like macromolecule twisting in the form of a double helix. So now we knew that um, DNA was our source of genetic information, but we didn't know at this point in time how that was put together. And through a, a process of experiments, James Watson, Francis Crick, described the structure of DNA being a very long ladder-like macromolecule that twisted to form this double helix with each strand of the helix made up of subunits we call nucleotides, and we'll see nucleotides in chapter two. Um, Watson and Crick were awarded the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1962 for their work on the structure of DNA. And we will look at the structure of um, DNA in future lectures where we consider um, DNA replication and gene expression. We'll look at it somewhat in chapter two when we're looking at macromolecules, but we'll really focus in on it later on uh, this term. Now I wanna go ahead and talk about model organisms. So we had all of this research between the late, you know, kind of mid late 1800s and now we're in the mid 1900s. Initial research in genetic studies relied on a wide range of organisms to examine principles, inherita principles of inheritance and really try to rule out hypotheses, solidify hypotheses, um, Mendel used the P in the 1960s. All of these model organisms, and we're going to see that there are a variety of them, helped us understand human appearance, human health, human disease, human behaviors, and we're still using model organisms today. Because inherit since patterns are universal in many plants and animals, scientists have come to focus their attention on a small number of organisms, specifically what we call model organisms, to look at genes involved in these characteristics. So by definition, a model organism is one used for the study of basic biological processes. So we're looking at cellular events, we're looking at aging, we're looking at cancer, other diseases, we're looking at the immune system, we're looking at behavior. Generally, to be considered a model organism, organisms need to have a series of characteristics. Um, and, and I think as I explain them to you, you're going to understand why. So model organisms need to have a very short half-life. could be minutes, hours, days, weeks. Compared to humans with a life cycle of, you know, potentially 80, 90 years. And this is critical as a model organism because as we study genetics, the rate limiting factor is often life cycle. From conception to the time an organism is old enough to reproduce, we want to see a very short timeline because this accelerates the pace of research generally. We want to see as a model organism, small organisms, things that can be housed in a lab with the use of very little space. So when you think about lab space, you want to be thinking about model organisms that fit a lab space. And they need to be inexpensive to keep alive, requiring just basic food sources, nothing complicated, nothing expensive, nothing difficult to store, nothing difficult to secure. We want something inexpensive and easy to keep these organisms alive. 
Now, important as well, we want them to be able to produce many, many offspring. And we're going to see how this is key coming up in a few chapters. But the ability to look at traits quantitatively um, is in part the ability to produce many offspring. When we look at Mendel, he looked at over 20,000 pea plants over that seven-year window. That's incredible. When you think about it, we can't use humans. We can't use large um, mammals to study some of these traits. We need to be looking at small organisms, the short life cycle, taking up little space, very inexpensive um, to keep alive, producing many offspring. And that's not something us humans and many mammals have the ability to contribute. Um, humans, we want to see there's some kind of relatedness uh, we want to see an evolutionary connection so that if we study one gene in one organism, maybe it's a fly, we can tie it to um, ourselves. If we're looking at a trait in another organism, we want to be able to make the connection to ourselves as the study of humans. So, uh, you know, fruit flies have 17,000 genes. Humans have 20,000 genes. Um 75% of human disease-causing genes are thought to have some kind of homologous gene in the fruit fly. So when we look at fruit flies, we're looking, I mean, they, they're like decidedly different. I mean, no one can argue that fruit flies and humans look the same. However, they share quite a bit of genes. 75% um, of human disease-causing genes are thought to have some kind of homologous gene in Drosophila or the fruit fly. So we are similar to the fruit fly, and specifically, we're similar in genes important for understanding human disease. So what are these model organisms? So here's my um, slide with model organisms. So the first one we cover, and we're going to look at this quite a bit, is Drosophila melanogaster. This is the common fruit fly, and it's used in classical genetics. When I was an undergrad in the early 90s, we worked with Drosophila um, in the lab. We spent one of our two terms of genetics playing with fruit flies. They are used in classical genetics to study chromosomes and genes. Um, today, the fruit fly is used quite a bit in developmental biology. Um, but when I looked at Drosophila and what many scientists looked at at the time they were being used very regularly was they were trying to gain a better understanding of how genes were positioned on chromosomes. And again, looking at their five criteria, they, they fit these five criteria. So next model organism is the common mouse. So mus musculus. Because they are mammals and genetically close to humans, they're used for the study of development of body tissues. They are used to look at the function of mammalian immune systems. They're looked at for the formation and the function of the brain and the nervous system. Mice are used as model organisms to look at mechanisms of cancer, of human disease. And it's common and it's really easy in a lab to remove genes from mice so as to understand the function of the genes. When a, when a gene is there, what's the function as compared to when it's missing? What is wrong with that mouse? And so mice have short life cycle. They're small. They're inexpensive to keep alive. They produce many offspring. They have a very short, um, that short life cycle really plays into it for being a mammal. Uh, those were our first, what we like to call first generation model organisms. So the common mouse and the fruit fly, those were what we call first generation model organisms. But then as time goes by, we see geneticists use um, E. coli. So E. coli becomes um, an important model organism. It's a bacteria with small um, you know, of course, it's very small. It's unicellular. Rapid reproduction rate it has a, a growth rate of about every 20 minutes in, in ideal conditions. And it grows in this very simple nutrient broth. It's used to study DNA replication. It's used to study transcription and translation. So the process of producing protein. We can use bacteria like E. coli to consider gene regulation. We can look at cell cycle. We can target antibiotics. Um, and study new antibiotics and um, use E. coli that way. 
Um, we have uh, a, a roundworm called C. elegans. It is, it's been a, a really great model organism because it has a very small number of cells in the body. It has 959 cells in its body on average. And it's led to our understanding of apoptosis in the study of cancer. Apoptosis is controlled cell death. It can be used in developmental biology and examining cell lineage. It's been um, used to study the formation and function of the nervous system. It's been used to look at cell proliferation, of course, cancer genes, and again, that piece with um, apoptosis. Our next model organism is Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a plant with a short life cycle. And um, so we see that right here. It's used for many areas of plant biology study. Uh, it's studied in development and physiology of plants as well as is looked at for making advances in agricultural applications such as immunity and infectious disease in plants. Our next model organism, um, we're getting there, um, is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So it's a yeast, common yeast. It's a eukaryote. It's unicellular. It has a rapid reproduction and it's commonly used in the study of the cell cycle and cell division. It's further used to understand gene regulation and chromosome structure as well as aging, if you can believe that. So yeast. And then lastly, the zebrafish. We see the zebrafish here, Danio rario, and it's used to study vertebrate development um, with the egg, embryo, and larva all being transparent. It's really nice to be able to see development in this transparent early life cycle. It's extensively used in developmental biology. So because of the well-characterized um, genetics, these species, these model organisms have been used in the study of very basic biological processes. They've helped shed light on many aspects of biology, um, behavioral biology, cancer biology, um, genetics, etc. To put this idea to use, scientists may rely on the bacteria E. coli for the study of colon cancer, which seems unusual until one really understands that E. coli in humans rely on a similar process of DNA repair, uh, ultimately the issue that surrounds colon cancer. And the gene involved in DNA repair is the same one in humans as well as in E. coli. Uh, so do take some of those things into consideration. I will want you to know these five characteristics and for you to be able to um, outline those five characteristics to me and discuss some of these model organisms in very general terms. Now, uh, to gain some foundation in some of our very early discussions in the coming modules that we're going to look at, it makes sense to introduce to you some of the very general terms and terminology associated with genetics. And I, I encourage you to keep these terms in a special place, like make a separate worksheet in your notes if you take notes. Keep your list going as we move through the course, and you'll see that we'll start off with some definitions here, but those, even those definitions may be modified as we move through the course and gain a better understanding of different um, components. So genetics. Genetics is the branch of biology concerned with the study of inherited traits. Simple as that. And specifically genes and the interactions um, genes have with the internal and external environment. So what's happening inside our body is internal environment. What's happening outside the body, temperature, nutrition, etc. is external environment. Those factors um, lend to the expression of a given trait. We have heredity. Heredity is the, um, the the general definition of heredity is just the sum of all biological processes by which particular characteristics, our physical characteristics, our health characteristics, sometimes even personality, are transmitted from parent to offspring. Inheritance, this is how our traits or our characteristics are passed on from one parent to offspring. We typically call this the mode of inheritance. And we'll spend time this term talking about different inheritance patterns. We'll first look at autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant. We will consider mitochondrial inheritance. And we're going to look at sex-linked inheritance amongst some other potential concepts. We talk about the genome. The genome is the complete or the entire set of DNA instructions found in a cell. And humans, in humans, the genome consists, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes located in the cell's nucleus, as well as small chromosomes in our mitochondria that's called extranuclear um, genes. 
and we're going to talk about the mitochondria in chapter two. But ultimately, a genome contains all the information necessary for an individual to develop and function. Genes, genes are considered the basic unit of inheritance. They're passed on from parent to offspring, and most genes code for proteins. I often refer to anything coded by a gene as a gene product because not all genes code for proteins, but you might have heard it as a DNA codes for RNA, RNA codes for protein. I like to say in this whole um, kind of big picture is genes ultimately code for some kind of a gene product, oftentimes a protein. And when they are proteins, they have various functions in the body, commonly specifying physical and biological traits. Um, humans have more than 20,000 protein coding genes, and we're just going to touch the surface by looking at a few dozen this term. Alleles. So here's the thing about alleles. Alleles are protein encoding genes that may vary slightly in DNA sequence from person to person. So base sequences, we're talking about nucleotides. And those little components that make up a gene, there might be some mutations there. There could be a few changes there where one base is, is something in one individual, one base is something else in another individual, but they still code for the same gene, just a variant of a gene. More formally, we say that alleles are defined as alternative forms of a gene, with different alleles producing different observable features, or a phenotype, which we'll get to in a few moments. An individual inherits two alleles, so one allele from one parent, one allele from another parent, for any given location in the genome where variation exists. And we'll find later on that if two alleles are the same, we're going to discover there's a term for that. It's called homozygous for an allele. And if the alleles are different, we call that heterozygous. So we're going to see that in a moment. Now, next up, uh, we have chromosomes, autosomes, and sex chromosomes. So chromosomes, I think everybody should know what chromosomes are. 23 structures by which DNA sequences of the human genome are laid out. Ultimately, an organism's DNA with its various array of genes is organized into these structures that we call genomes, or sorry, chromosomes, sorry about that, which act as carriers for transmitting genetic information from one generation of an organism to the next. So from my parent to me, from me to my daughter. Um, we also have autosomes. So chromosomes generally, that's the big one, but then we have two different types of chromosomes. We have autosomes and sex chromosomes. The term autosome, which those do not differ between sexes, um, those are just chromosomes that we have. We have 20 true pairs of them that don't differ between sex. And then we have our sex chromosomes. These are chromosomes involved in determining the sex of an organism. Now, in humans, we have XY. And X's typically lend toward female. So female has two X chromosomes in cells while males have an X and Y. Um, that's natural. Um, there are some um, slight modifications to that in certain diseases, but we say females are XX, males are XY. But if you look at other organisms, they might have different sex chromosomes. And so that's something to keep in mind if you end up taking a genetics class at a higher level. Uh, moving on. Somatic cells and gametes. So here are two new terms. Somatic cells are the cells in the body other than sperm and egg cells. We typically call them non-sex cells. Instead of saying somatic, I tend to use the term non-sex cells. These cells contain two sets of chromosomes, one inherited from each parent. So in my cells, I have um, a set that came from my father, a set that came from my mother, one inherited from each parent, and we are said to be diploid. Diploid simply means containing a complete set, or I should say two complete sets of chromosomes, one from each parent. Gametes, on the other hand, gametes are the reproductive cells of the body. And in humans, the female gamete is called the ova or the egg, whereas the male gamete is called sperm. These cells carry only one copy of each chromosome as compared to our somatic or non-sex cells. And because they only carry one copy of each gene, so egg carries a copy from mother, sperm carries a copy from father, those are said to be haploid as compared to diploid in our non-sex or our somatic cells. During fertilization, egg and sperm will unite to form now a new diploid organism. <laughs> 
let's see, we have some more definitions. We're getting there. Uh, so next up, we have genotype and phenotype. And I typically ask this question on an exam, differentiate between the two. Genotype is simply the set of alleles of a given trait carried on an organism. It's the, the individual's genetic makeup. In contrast, and so I should, I should clarify that by saying the set of alleles, one from mom, one from dad. Um, but then we talk about phenotype. Phenotype includes the observable features or traits or other properties of an organism. Maybe it's a biochemical property or an effect on health, but those traits are made possible by different alleles of a, of a given gene, as well as an association with interactions, the internal environment, which might happen to be other gene products in the body, or external environment, um, and those environmental and Influences, which we might say food related, space related, um, exercise related, diet related, like all those things. Um, I, I think a good example of phenotype being controlled by both internal environment and external environment is height. When we talk about height, height is certainly controlled by genes. There are a handful of genes in the body that contribute toward height in one way or another. But height is also determined by the effects of hormones during puberty, so that's part of our internal environment, as well as by nutrition, which is the external environmental influence. I want to take a quick swing to a, a more broad concept, and I want to look at the three branches of genetic studies. So we are going to be looking at genetic studies more from a transmission perspective. The branch dealing with the transmission of genes from generation to generation is called transmission genetics. Sometimes it's called classical genetics or Mendelian genetics, and it focuses on the genotypes of individuals, and it'll be the primary study of this course. We will consider simple inheritance patterns in the human pedigree to examine transmission. In contrast, the branch dealing with the structure and function of genes at the molecular level. So what are those base pairs doing and what mutations might there be that create different alleles and different variants? That's called molecular genetics. And analyzing molecular events involved in the expression of genes is an example of the molecular genetics of study. We'll discuss this in some detail this term, but it's certainly more a, a 300, 400 level type of study between genetics and cell biology and even biochemistry. Lastly, the, um, the final branch of study of genetics examines the distribution and behavior of genes within a population. So not within an individual, but within a population itself. And so this is called population genetics. It's commonly studied mathematically. So we have um, that quantitative evaluation by analyzing the frequency of a given gene in a human population over time. And typically that's some kind of a disease causing gene. We will cover just a brief bit of population genetics at the very end of the term. As the world of genetics and genetic technology becomes more complex and in depth, the impact this discipline has on society has never been more profound. And I want to close this chapter by talking about this. Geneticists are pushing the frontiers of science, offering new hope for disease control and cure, offering new and unique solutions for fighting cancer, for many hereditary diseases. They provide hope for improving quality of life, extending life expectancy. Genetic technologies are also increasingly being used in criminal justice systems to exonerate the innocent, to convict the guilty. Yet, the field of genetics and its application in biotechnology, as well as in bioengineering, have developed much faster than social policy. And so I want to close this chapter just talking about some of this. As a society, we find ourselves grappling with genetics-related issues, such as access to and ensuring the safety of gene therapy to combat disease, which might be limited to those who can afford them and potentially increase inequality in health outcomes across the globe. We're studying with how society can avoid genetic discrimination, which results when people are treated differently by insurance companies or by employers because they have some kind of increased risk in developing an inherited disorder due to a gene mutation. Further, we're struggling with genetic privacy more generally. For instance, if we participate in some kind of direct-to-consumer test, like 23andMe or Ancestry.com, 
How do we know that our information will remain private? And that's a real sticky question. Who has access to the information? Can law enforcement have access to it? Can law enforcement use it? And ultimately, be, can it be used against you or even against a family member someday? There are also other social, ethical, and moral implications to consider. Um, how do we govern and oversee the use of germline editing technologies, ultimately changing our eggs or our sperm such that the genetics of all of our future generations are changed? How does that impact the healthcare sector? That is, a change in genes passed down through generations, ensuring we don't become a society intent on creating what you know, the media says is designer babies or superhumans. And in doing so, fundamentally, we, we could be altering the human species. And there are certainly some reasons why that's really important. Some diseases that can be um, wiped away because of germline editing. But when, where is the line? When do we cross that line? And as we move through this course, I want you to continue thinking about these things. What you're learning right now and how it can impact you and your future generations. And we'll cover some direct journal article topics that surround some of these concepts, the potential impacts of these genetic advances and what are the pros, what are the cons, what are the ethical concerns. So that's chapter one and we'll move on to chapter two for this module. Um, but if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to schedule a meeting um, or visit during office hours.